The Late Morning Program with Nam Ras Podcast. Hi Krishna, everyone. You are listening to the Late Morning Program, the number one Hi Krishna podcast in the world. My name is Nam Ras, and I'm here with Kastuba Prabhu. Prabhu, thank you so much for joining me. <laughs> it's always an honor, Nam Ras Prabhu. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Great. So happy for those back. of you who don't know, Kastuba Prabhu runs an amazing podcast called The Wisdom of the Sages, uh, where he and Raghunath Prabhu, from, uh, who's well known from Shelter, they read the Srimad Bhagavatam to like hundreds of people and comment on it in the, in, every morning. Uh, and uh, we'll t- give you more information about that podcast later. But I wanted to bring Kastuba Prabhu on to kind of show us and kind of tell us about his background because we know him as the, uh, you know, one of the main people there at the Wisdom of the Sages, but we don't know so much uh, about his background and everything about how he came to Krishna consciousness. So we're going to discuss that today and about what he's doing now and, you know, what what's the plan for the future. So Kastuba Prabhu, maybe we can start out. Uh, how did you come in contact with devotees? Um, I came into contact with devotees um, kind of growing up in New York. I mean, at first, I, I can't remember the first time I ever saw a devotee. It was, it was, it was likely in just on the street. or um, I, I definitely remember seeing them in Washington Square Park for the Ratiatra because I used to hang out in that park a lot when I was a kid. Right. Um, but really the where it became important or, you know, was that I was in this, I was part of this, at the time, very underground kind of punk rock, hard, New York hardcore scene. Right. Where there were devotees within that scene and there were devotees coming and intermingling <laughs> with that scene, you know. Right. Uh, so I would see um, devotees like the, w- there was, I'd say, two main clubs that we would hang that where we'd have like concerts and hang out shows. One was CBGB's kind of a legendary. A lot of people know about CBGB's it's a big famous. I mean, it was. Again, it was a very underground place, but its reputation is big. And right. um, and then there was another little place called A7, uh, which was on the corner of Avenue A and 7th Street. And uh, and so I would see the devotees. Um, they would sometimes come to the to the, to the shows um, and set up on the sidewalk and distribute, distribute prasadam. Or um, again, our hangout was Avenue A and like let's say between 7th Street and St. Mark's Place. And so the devotees would come there, you know, which is basically, you know, Tompkins Square Park, where Prabhupada yeah. began, you know, Sankirtan, you know. Uh, so devotees would come there and also distribute for some. So I'd see devotees there, but the the real influence was coming from people, friends of mine within that scene that um, had read Srila Prabhupada's books and could answer all my questions. <laughs> Somehow they could answer all my questions about life based on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't know how much detail you want me to go in, but these were very colorful characters, you know. Yeah, um, tell us about some of them. I'd love to hear. You, you know, a, a lot of listeners may know, and probably more don't know, but um, the New York hardcore scene at that time was very, um, it was very wild, you know. It was it, the the neighborhood was wild, and the the people, the kids. I mean, these are like the wildest kids, you know. You can <laughs> it, was, it was this wild scene. Everyone really young and just like just diving very headfirst into um, kind of a dark world, but also there was a lot of creativity and a lot of optimism mixed into it. It was a big mix, you know. It was like the people that were parts of those scenes. They may have been like the most abused, the most mixed up, the most intelligent, the most creative you know it was just like a a very intense group of young people all feeling some sense of intense alienation from the broader society Mm. and brought together in the only neighborhood that could contain that kind of thing at that time which was you know the the lower east side and you know allowed what was happening to go on and to the extent that it was there was a lot of violence there's a lot of drugs there's a lot of sex there's a lot of uh, hardcore rock and roll um going on and um some of my friends like were very influential in that scene 
some, you know, people know the Crow Mags, but if, if anyone was particularly influential to me in terms of developing Krishna consciousness, it was Harley Flanagan, who was a member of the band, the Crow Mags, and a, a friend of mine who I used to hang out with very regularly back when I was in my teens, going back to when I was even 15 years old. And um, he was um, very tough, little, you know, tough street kid, you know, very, I mean, really, <laughs> you know, like he was feared in that neighborhood. He was legendary in that neighborhood. And he was also, you know, very creative and, and actually an excellent musician, you know, from his early age, he, um, he was in, he was in bands when he was like 10 years old, you know, touring, you know, Europe and, you know, playing, playing clubs like CBGB's and Max's Kansas City and these places as a little kid. So he was just, um, had very unique karma, you know, had met actually Shri Prabhupada as an infant. His mother right. brought him to, to 26th Second Avenue, right? He, he lived, you know, his mother was, you know, kind of avant-garde and his aunt was also in a punk rock band that he was in as a kid. And uh, they lived in a building with Allen Ginsberg. Allen Ginsberg was a friend of theirs. And, you know, he, wow. he was just, he was just uh, very hard to pin this character down. Like, um, he, he was a mix of many different things. But all that being said, he was a tough street kid that didn't even go to high school, uh, but read Shil Prabhupada's books and was able to engage in conversation, you know, like, um, at least for me at that time, at that age, really able to um, communicate, uh, you know, Divyagana, you know, uh, transcendental knowledge. And I, to this day, it's really, I consider one of Shil Prabhupada's greatest glories is that this gentleman, you know, Vaishnava gentleman uh, from Bengal and Vrindavan, you know, sitting there, uh, you know, in Vrindavan writing these books, you know, uh, could write in such a way where the kids that I was growing up with were able to read it, understand it, and communicate it very, very effectively, <laughs> you know. I'd, Amazing. It's, it's, it's actually, the more that I think about it, the more that um, I just bow my head to Srila Prabhupada and say, you've given so much, you know, uh, how, how, how he was empowered by Krishna to communicate bhakti and communicate Krishna consciousness is something really special and unique. So it was within that scene, uh, and amongst there, there were quite a few friends that were into it, you know, and, and so amongst them, I, I was just introduced to it. So I was searching, you know, I was going through my whatever, you know, teenage kind of like trying to find out what I was going to do with my life. Um, it definitely wasn't going to be, you know, a, a regular mainstream kind of life for me. I, I decided that at a very early age. Right. And um, I was kind of, I, I suppose my, you know, as a young teen, even from like when I was 13 or so, it, I was looking at political ideas and uh, you know, just you know, I suppose people that I admired were like um, political figures, you know. Um, and as I got into that scene on the Lower East Side and began to associate with some people that were from those kind of, you know, had those kind of political leanings, I wasn't impressed, you know, with the different kind of activists and so on that, that were there. I kind of saw a lot of the same kind of, um, you know, it began, it became clear to me that it was like kind of like two sides with the same kind of an art that's just like, Right. bickering with each other, you know, uh, and, and I wasn't finding anyone that I really admired. Um, and then I think I began to look more spiritual in, into more spiritual direction, uh, you know, looking into the Bible and, you know, or, um, reggae music and, you know, I don't just wherever I could find something that interests me, but where I found some kind of truth. Um, so in that mindset, and in that neighborhood and with the set of friends that I had, it was natural that I would be exposed to Srila Prabhupada's books. And so because my friends were able to answer all my questions very convincingly, um, through their recommendation, I began to read Prabhupada's books. And, and when I read Prabhupada's books, it was like everything was clicking for me. It was, it was um, so um, the, the truth in them was ringing and resonating with me so, so strongly that um before long i knew that it would just be uh it wouldn't be long <laughs> i felt inevitable mm -hmm. that i was going to go this direction before you go on i wanted to kind of 
talk a little bit about the Chromags. What was sure. it about them? That, because it's not just you. There was a number of devo- number of devotees who are still devotees to this day who came were introduced to Krishna consciousness through them. But when I look at them, the Chromags, it's like they're very kind of like um, – like the hardcore scene, it was like very tough and very kind of like when you think of devotees, it's not, I don't, you don't think of that immediately, you know? It's no, like a, it's from the last thing you think of. Yeah, right. So <laughs> I guess I, I, I want to know what was it about them that made them like so many people attract to Christian consciousness through them? Well, they, again, um, they were leaders in that scene musically. Right. They were leaders in that scene, you know, just like physically, you know, <laughs> like in other words, just like as, as their street presence was um, profoundly felt, you know, in the scene and in that neighborhood. So they were feared, you know, on, in, on one level. They were they're very um, central to that. So they, they definitely caught your attention. You, you know, I was I was a kid that was like I was glad they were my friends, you know, like in that world. Right. It was I was I was a lot better off that they were my friends than if they weren't. Um, and then I think uh, when their band came out, uh, which was uh, honestly, I got into hardcore when in 1981. I was 15 years old. By the time 1984 was rolling around, I was already starting to get out of it. I was l- losing some interest. In that scene, I was losing a little interest in the music. Um, it was for different reasons, yeah. um, and and you know, beginning to branch into some other worlds. But still, I was still in that same neighborhood, and I was still hanging out with a lot of those same guys. So when the Chromags actually really kicked off, it was really by the time I was starting to get out of hardcore. Um, but they were my buddies, and I, you know, and I would see them, you know, on, on the regular, just you know, hanging out. Um, so musically, they didn't really influence me. Uh, like, it wasn't their music that brought me to Krishna consciousness. It was just my friendship with them. But mm-hmm. when their band kicked off, it 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 kind of um, set off a new era of that music. It kind of like it kind of um, took it to its next stage, and they went broader and wider. And so people were into that band because of the music, because of the image, the whole thing. Yeah. Um, but the, but they built you know they had a message of 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 Krishna consciousness within it, and so it brought it, it brought a lot of people to it, you know. So, so I think to this day, even, you know, right was influenced yeah. by them. Yeah, and and Raghunath's band was a very different kind of band. His his, his was right. like a straight edge band, which was like you know it was a very kind of like positive, um, you know, don't do drugs and and so on. And uh, Chromax were more like you know like just street kids that you know like that kind of like thing i see but, okay. but the but there was no um no doubt that musically scene and 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 the music and everything and then you were getting more into krishna consciousness yeah yeah it, it, i started really getting into krishna consciousness i guess in 1986 so that was mm-hmm. a couple of years down the road where i was like my fr- like again those friends were into let's say from 84 and 85 and i was hanging out with them but by 86 i started to explore it myself right um and i wasn't uh, i don't know i wasn't ready to just kind of jump on the bandwagon at first really? yeah oh. um but uh what happened was was one night in 1987 in january of 1987 um i'm walking down st mark's place and i bump into an old friend a friend of mine from that time and he said you know what's up you know just whatever and and then he said um there's a program a krishna program going on in john's apartment tonight and john meant uh john joseph from the crow mags and uh he had an apartment on clinton street and uh he said are you gonna go to it and I was like, ah, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I didn't have any particular inclination, even though I was getting interested in all this stuff. But uh, it's still, I didn't really identify with it. And uh, and then he mentioned, my friend mentioned, well, you know, there'll be some good food there, probably, you know. And I said, you, you know, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I didn't have a lot of money, and uh, and so it seemed like, you know, okay, my friends are there. It's at the, you know, their apartment. I'll go check it out. So I and I ended up wandering over there. 
uh, on some cold night in January of 87. And when I got there, it was a small apartment. Um, it was much cleaner than I had ever seen it before. And uh, it was almost bare. There wasn't, there's, you know, it was in the New York apartments real small and there was almost no furniture. And I remember there's a milk carton cut open and some flowers in it placed like in the middle of the floor. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was just hanging out and uh, there's just a few of us there. And then the guest arrived, walked in the door and it was Tamal Krishna Goswami, um, which is something, you know, it's an interesting thing. This was like, you know, you know, it was a tough neighborhood at the time. And um, it was just a few of these kids. And, you know, you take a look at these kids and it seemed like they were really mixed up <laughs> kids, you know, like a little, I, I haven't gone into full description of them and what they were like, but right, right. They, they're the kind of people, you know, that like, if you're walking down the street, you know, like normal people, like cross the street, you know. <laughs> if, if for the point. listeners who want to know about the Cromax, just Google them and you will understand. Yeah, yeah it was like that. Like, just to give you an idea, like Harley, when he was like 15 years old, he had his entire chest, like a huge, um, a huge tattoo of like this winged kind of demoniac, like bat wings, like covering his whole chest and, and, and it was running, it had a lightning bolt coming down on his head and in his hand, it had a chain and it's swinging the chain. And on the end of the chain is the earth. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and uh and i remember like just and he would rarely wear a shirt you know so like he's just walking around the city with a pit bull in this tent you know as a 15 year old kid you know it was like that wow. um and i remember once someone asking you know someone was asking him about the tattoo and and it's, and, and uh you know it's, it, it's they're saying what does it mean what does it represent and he says it means that the demons are taking over the earth and he said, and then the person said, well, are you for it or against it? <laughs> and, and he said, well, you know, when I got it, I was for it, but now I'm against it. <laughs> wow. But um, are you still in touch with him? And occasionally, you know, a, a couple of times a year, we check in with each other. Nice. Yeah. He's, nice. he's, he's a good hearted person. You know, there's a lot of tension in that scene, a lot of fighting. I, I personally um, just have just respect and um gratitude to anyone in that scene that was into krishna consciousness that totally. helped me get into it i i have nothing in my heart except um uh gratitude for them but within that scene there's a lot of tension and, and, and so yeah on. yeah and, and, and you know a lot of those guys they have very difficult upbringings as kids you know yeah so um so, so you were saying in the uh, apartment so yeah so when i walked into that apartment i was just with a few of them just just maybe five six seven people tops and tamal krishna goswami who at that time was really like pretty much the most important leader in iskhan you know right. and he just walked in there and he sat down and i don't remember so much about that talk it would be very interesting to see if i could find that if you know if it's in some kind of archive if, if it was recorded i don't know if it was um but what i do remember was that the theme of the talk was how when material energy is engaged in service, it becomes spiritualized. And you know, it must have been recorded because I remember him saying, and this was 35 years ago or so, you know, I remember him saying, you can title this talk, the magic wand talk, because it said it's like a magic wand, you know, it's like how, how it transforms material into spiritual through service. So um, I was impressed. You know, I was very impressed with his presentation. And um, I was also impressed with my friends and their response to him, you know, like that he walked in the door and, and they were bowing down and showing such uh, their behavior towards him was very respectful and, and, and so on. So when I walked out of that apartment on that night, I remember thinking, okay, that's it. You know, this is, this is what I'm doing with my life, you know. Um, and uh, I think how and exactly how um, that happens, we don't know. For all we know, those same personalities are taking birth again in the movement and, and serving him again. Or, you know, Srila Prabhupada is speaking to, to us or to people yet to be born, uh, inspiring them in ways uh, to serve and expand things. So I don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, I won't even be around much longer, you know, so, so I don't worry. I don't really worry about it. Um, but, uh, 
so I guess at this point, I just try to um, try to deepen my my uh, my relationships with those. You know, there's still the devotees around. There's so many. You know, yeah. someone like Prajumna Prabhu who lives right here in New York. The 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 the, the, the um the treasure of Srila Prabhupada's association that he has and, and the depth of his own insights, just unfathomable, you know? And, he's a fan and, of the podcast. Of of your podcast. Yeah, yeah. He yeah, messages yeah, yeah. me. He's like, oh, great yeah. episode. This and then I always try to put in like, Prabhu, I'd really love to have you on. He's like, he's like, never do it. I just study Shastra. I don't. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Right. And I, then I, he's like, ask me later. And I have a timer on like six months later. I ask him again, Prabhu, can you please come? I'm <laughs> chipping away at him. Let's see. Oh, I hope you do. I hope you do. Yeah. I you, know, you, epic if you could come. You know, you take a, a devotee like Shamasundra Prabhu. And not to, I shouldn't say just Shama Sundar. I'd say that oh, Shama Sundar Prabhu and Mukunda and Malati and that whole, you know, that whole group. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, you know, what can you say about their lives? You know, like all that they gained in their association with Srila Prabhupada. And to me, to in my own heart, that group of devotees is very special. Um, the, the mood in which they served. And the style in which they served, I find, um, re for me personally, very inspiring. Um, yeah. And the and the the depth of their devotion for Prabhupada is so special, you know. So yeah, you know, it won't be long. You know, it won't be long. To, you know, th th there'll be a few that hang on a little bit, you know, extra. Um, and but but many of them will, you know, are are leaving us now, and will be leaving sometime soon. And so again, I. Um, it's 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 I'm, it's partially sad. I'm not afraid. Like I don't feel that. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, I I have faith that that uh, you know, in always there are dark periods and brighter periods and ups and downs and so yes. on. But yes. in the end, you know, uh, Krishna's desire and the the desire of the devotee will I have faith will will manifest. I like and, that positive outlook yeah. on it. Because, because whenever I talk to devotees about it, it's like the decade of tears is upon us, and all you know, and I'm like, I understand it's yeah, it's going to be bad, but there's also a different perspective. There. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the subject of the podcast, which was uh the Bhakti Center, and yeah, for those of you, uh, for those of you listeners who don't know, the Bhakti Center is a uh temple slash um. Reaching center, cultural, I think, cultural I center, vernacular. yeah, cultural yeah. center in Manhattan, uh, one block away from 262nd Avenue on yeah. 25 First Avenue, and a uh, very successful center in the sense of introducing Krishna consciousness to uh, the New York native New York people, like just uh, normal uh, New York people, and, and making it kind of approachable uh, for people you know, what we say, Western people. So mm -hmm. uh, Super Prabhu is actually one of the uh, main uh, members of the, when, in its inception, uh, we could say, I want to talk a little bit about that and and basically how it developed and lessons learned and things. It yeah, started with how it developed. Okay, well, you know, maybe I could go back just a little bit further just to connect yeah, sure. it with uh, what we are talking about earlier because sure. part of my relationship with Tamal Krishna Goswami was um i mean i categorize i didn't even go too deep into that but like you know there's a whole like convert vrindavan thing and, and how he trained his his disciple he and his god brothers and god sisters trained his disciples in vrindavan that was really important in my life oh can um, you talk about that i'd like to hear about that <laughs> yeah we can we can go back if you like hey, let's go back let's go back okay and then there's another side which i'll which was going to segue into the other thing which was okay. more like um preaching or whatever you want to call it in in the western world right but um you know from i guess i think the first time i went to Vrindavan was in 89 and um but all those years up until he passed away every year i would spend time with him in my in Vrindavan. and uh you know he and 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 especially his close god brothers giri rod swami and i could go on and name many names um but they I one thing I so much appreciate from them is they set up, you know, like a, a, a kind of like a training that, that was the Vrindavan Institute of Higher Education, VIHE at the time. Uh, Bori John Prabhu and many, so many were involved in that. But it meant that like 
every year I would go to Vrindavan and spend a month just, you know, studying Shastra under really excellent teachers. And then they would take us to all of the, the Leelastans in, in Vrindavan and, and reveal, you know, to them, speak, you know, speak the Leelas and, and train us how to understand it as they felt Prabhupada would want us to understand it, you know. And so through that, you know, you develop some attraction, some some bhava, you know, for for the holy dams, which becomes, you know, really fun. You know, Raghunath and myself, what we do with wisdom and sage, so much of it grows out of that. We had that experience together, right. you know, um, of of living in Vrindavan and being trained by the same group of, of Vaishnavas and um, being in the Krishna Balaram Mandir and doing our prikramas and and, and all of that. It it, it really became. Uh, I, I think that there was a period after Prabhupada left where um, maybe things got a little off course and, you know, there was competition between the zones and there was, you know, people were being engaged in, you know, collecting money and, and all of that. My upbringing wasn't like that at all. You know, I came right, I, I joined in 87. That was right when everything had collapsed, right? Like, you know, a, a whole group of of the the original gurus in this kind of had, had all disappeared in, in in all kind of ways. The new Vrindavan thing was like at its height of um, uh, public, you know, scandal or whatever you want to call it. You know, mm -hmm. so everything was kind of like that was the end of that era in a sense. And maybe what really led into the next era was, if, at least from my perspective was the development of what was going on in Vrindavan and the VIHE and in the experience that you could have in the Krishna Balaram temple and, and, and so on. And the the Gormando Prakramas and, and things like that. So right. those days were really essential for my understanding of what bhakti is, and what what Vaishnavism is, what Gaudiya Vaishnavism is. So those were wonderful as educational experiences. They were wonderful as as um uh, opening my eyes to what bhakti was. And to this day, you know, the sentiments that I have, you know, for Vrindavan and for Krishna and so on were largely, you know, that was the birth of them in my heart. Um, so so there's there's a, a beautiful w world of that, you know. Uh, uh, it was like, honestly, living, I used to live, when I would go to Vrindavan, I would live in this little house right on the Prikrama Mark. Do you know where, where Tamal Krishna Goswami stayed? Yeah, yeah. That little corner. Between, yes. Yeah, I'm down that alley. And so I would stay in that house. He had a tiny, tiny little room, just like you, you, when I say big enough for a bed, not big enough even for like a, a Western bed, like, you know, just one of these little Indian kind of mini beds right. and not much more. He stayed in that little room and then it opened up to a bigger room and I would sleep there and serve him, you know, all the time there. And living in that house with him uh, was like living in Chaitanya's Leela for me. You know, like the different Vaishnavas that are coming in and out every day, the the prasadam pastimes and the and the prikramas and and all of that. It was always exciting. There was always something dynamic happening because he was such a central and important character in Iskhan, and uh, and because Vrindavan was so vibrant, there was always something exciting going on. And being around him, it it really felt like being in Chaitanya Leela. You know that that temple was. Boy, Krishna Balaram Mandir at that time was like every class and every kirtan, you know, every festival was just like off the charts. So it was, it was beautiful, beautiful. You know, Indra Prabhu, of course, was there the whole time, and yeah. you know, so it was a, it was a wonderful, wonderful kind of um, experience in, in training. Mm. So there's that, but then, but then, then you know, I go back to the West, and it was just traveling Sankirtan, you know, um, and but when Tamal Krishna Goswami went back to the university and he was, he began to study at um, Southern Methodist University in Dallas. So at that time, I would spend a lot of time in, doing travel in the same time in Texas so I could spend a lot of time with him. And um, and so there, whenever I was there with him in the in the temple in, in Dallas, when we would chant Japa during the Japa period, he would just sit me down right next to him. Like he kind of just reserved that spot for me and allowed me to sit next to him as he chanted. And so he would chant. And then towards the end, like with the last 10 minutes of the job period, whatever, he would just kind of stop and turn to me and begin to talk to me. And the way that he would talk to me was like, um, it was, 
it was like a it was like a kind of a training you know i i felt like he was like trying to How's that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Got it. okay, we're back. So <laughs> these mics uh, the, they build a, such a great mic, but the cable, the the connection is like so weak if you just tap it, it can not Oh really? Oh yeah. interesting. I don't know if you can edit that out or anything, but in any case. It wasn't um, that much. So okay. okay. <laughs> so uh yeah, so so we would talk at the end and, and I really it really what I not, how I understand what he was doing to me is that he was training me to think. And he was trying mm -hmm. to get me to think in a way that wasn't stereotypical. So like he would ask me, you know, like he would say, what do you think about what so-and-so Maharaj is doing over here? Or what do you think about what, you know, he would, he would ask me all different kinds of things. And what I found was that I, he was not looking, he would not tolerate just mediocre answers, stereotypical answers. You know, if I said, oh, it's ecstatic, Guru Dave, it's um, <laughs> Jai, you know, like that. No, he would, why? You know, why? You oh. know, and he, he wanted me to think critically. And so, you know, when someone's doing that with you every day, <laughs> you're going to realize I better think deeply about these things. You know, it, it would force me to, to, to think deeply when I'm answering him, to think more deeply just in my observations in general, you know, to kind of grow up a little bit and try to see things more deeply. So I felt, I feel to this day, I feel like what he was doing to me was trying to train me to, to think creatively in terms of present presenting Bhakti. Can you give an example of like what he would ask you? Uh, well, it was things like that. Like, in other words, there's so many different projects and so many different leaders oh, and see. so many different temples. So he'd ask me what I would think about them. Oh, I see. Okay. But, but not only that, it also began to, it, it also, it would, you know, it, topics could be things like um, other religious movements or, you, you know, uh, um, even, you know, uh, current events and things like that. You know, it, mm. it, it could be like that or, yeah, there's things like that. So, so, um, but I, I, I remember one thing that he told me once was he told me, and I say this and I want to say this without, um, I want to make sure I represent what he said well and uh and i want to preface it by not like i don't want this to to sound critical or um negative but i just think it was his way of training me but he said he said the temples in america are not working <laughs> and more or less that's it that might have been his exact words if it wasn't it was something similar to that right he right. said he said currently they're they're not um they're not effective you know in reaching people with krishna consciousness and he said and somebody's going to have to figure out how to do it and he said um and he, and then he said and i'll tell you one thing it'll have less to do with preaching and more to do with teaching mm. i just remember him saying that to me wow okay so so it's really from that mindset of like feeling like, okay, I have 13 years of book distribution um, behind me, which to me was like, um, was that's like a full on daily training in presenting Krishna consciousness, you know, presenting to trying to present it to hundreds of people every day. You right. know? And then, you know, my own studies and the Sangha that I had been blessed with and the times in Vrindavan that I've been blessed with. So at, when I get married, I, you know, I moved back to New York with the idea of how am I going to apply all this? How, how am I going to, this background, how am I going to use it? What, what do I, what am I going to do with it now? Um, and it was right at that time that he passed away. Um, but overlapping with that time was my relationship with Radha Swami uh, developing, you know, a few years prior to that. And so when my guru passed away, um, it, uh, he was a person that I naturally turned to um, in terms of how I will serve now. You know, I, 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 my mood was to take shelter of a Vaishnava um, and, and, and allow them to guide me. So he was the natural person that I turned to at that time. And um, 
early on, like I remember as early as 2003, discussing the idea of creating a cultural center in New York City, which eventually became the Bhakti Center. And in 2003, now, so now we're on the topic of the Bhakti Center, uh, right. which where you originally asked. And, but I'm presenting it very much from my own, at least to start with, from my own perspective, from my own angle. Of yeah. Um, but, you know, in discussing it with him in 2003, um, the, from the very first discussion, uh, I said, well, what's the first step, you know? And um, for me, he said, you should become a yoga teacher, which was something that I had never considered doing before. Wow. Um, that early, 2000, he said that 2000, in 2000, 2003. Wow. So the next day I was like, you know, checking out the yoga studios in New York. And within a few days I was uh, with Eddie Stern um, on Broom Street at what was then called the Stunga Yoga New York, which by the way, the Broom Street Temple is about to reopen. Did you hear that? No, I didn't know that. Yeah. the really? It's going to reopen. It's going it's to reopen in the exact same spot this month, apparently. What about that whole altar and all that stuff that was there? Well, like that Rana, and all that. Rana are yeah, right here. here. Yeah, but yeah, but the Ganesh Temple will will be reopened there. Is the what was it? What is it functioning as like right now? Uh, right now, it's probably not functioning as anything, but it became a yoga studio, like a, a different yoga, a different, more like kind of corporate yoga, you know, oh, studio with many with many, um, uh, like like a chain yoga studio kind of took it over. Oh, um, so they probably took out that like, because they had like an oh, that, oh, that's I'm, I would imagine they took all that out, but that I'm not fantastic. sure. Like that that yeah. old it was <laughs> amazing. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so I ended up uh, at at uh, on Broom Street at Ashtanga Yoga New York with Eddie Stern there, and for me that was um, important because for different reasons. One was because it it um, it did something for me that I think is very healthy if people want to learn to present bhakti to people mm. is you have to live with the people and you have to actually make friends with the people and you have to really get to see the world from their angle and so on which i didn't even as a brahmachari even though i was out on traveling sangertown and going to rock concerts and going to college campuses like every day it's, it's a different thing right when you actually like live with people and and and, and generally befriend people um and, and and really begin to understand the way that so for me my time uh at uh Ashtanga Yoga New York, and which led to Eddie Stern inviting me to also open up a Krishna, a Radha Krishna temple in that space, and then using it as what then we started calling it the Broom Street Temple. For me, that that was a, a really valuable time for me. Um, I had I had it challenged everything in my I don't know if challenged the right word, but in other words, I had to adjust. I had to step out of my bubble to live in that world, and for me, I feel it was a very healthy exercise um and but beyond that it also for me opened up a lot of relationships and um a lot of opportunities that to this day i'm still connected with so so i'm you know i'm starting uh this is the way that i understand how the bhakti center really developed mm. and that is that in new york city radna swami had no official role there but he was coming there regularly and there, I would call like different devotees. I would say we were like satellites of him in a way, you know. Mm. And and uh, what would qualify them or make them a satellite beyond their affection for him and and his affection for them was they're beginning to 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 allow themselves to be shaped by his vision in a certain way, you know. So you had you know, the Yogi Purusha's ashram in kind of in the middle of it because they were taking care of 26 Second Avenue, which was the center that was in that neighborhood and, you know, and and uh, being guided by his vision. Not, again, not officially, but, but right. you know, practically. Um, and then what I was doing was uh, significant and it became significant because it became a place to do kirtan and, and have Radha Krishna deities where you could really like invite anybody in and have a far out cool experience. And there's more space there than 26 second Avenue, but it was also because it wasn't so deep in the ISKCON bubble. It was like people felt yeah. more comfortable there, I guess. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, Gauravani, you know, would come there and then, you know, I was 
trying to drag you know Ananta and Achuta, and, and I think because they had Radha Krishna deities, they they opened it. They they were very difficult to get them to come to a yoga studio or something like that. But because it was a Radha Krishna temple, they began to come there regularly, and and that was really wonderful. And uh, and, and and so in any case, there was something happening there. But then you had you know many other devotees. You know you had Raghunath, you had Yogi Charu, you had uh, Yogeshwar Prabhu, and, and many, I don't want to you know. I'm definitely going to miss names, but so you had these different devotees that were getting each one had their own kind of field of outreach right. in the area. And then you had the ashram right in the middle of it. And, um, and of course, you know, let's say that we started talking about in 2003, but when, when did, when did we actually move to 25 first Avenue? I think that was probably like maybe 86. Uh, 2006 or seven, I think. Seven, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe four years down the road. Yeah. So, but in my mind, even in those four years, it was like it wasn't called the Bhakti Center in my mind, but you know, I knew something was coming, you know. And Radha Swami was so, you know, I don't, I don't want, I want to say this the right way, but, um, but he was so insightful. Let's put it this way: he was so insightful. That he used to tell the brahmacharis that were living just in a small apartment on the lower east side and, and operate on a 26 second avenue he would tell them you know the devotees um at what was then called the sanctuary which was an offshoot of new vrindavan and you know very much excommunicated and and you know um officially as well as socially you know at that time he would tell those brahmacharis you know be, befriend them and and um you know, I'm not sure how much they really did, but I think he could foresee that, um, well, let's say what, what eventually happened was it was difficult for them to maintain that building financially. It was difficult for them to maintain the worship of the deities. Mm -hmm. And they and of all the people they turned to, they turned to Radha Swami. You know, can you help us? Because he had the heart to always treat them like Vaishnavas and, and and always treat them with affection and love. And yeah. so um so they turned to him and he he uh told Yogi to move his ashram in, you know, into that building. Which meant, I lived there. Yeah, in, and you in, lived there. In two thousand seven. In two thousand seven, right. So so, and those, so and the other devotees were still there. And, and yeah. Bhaktapad was still there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Interesting times. <laughs> and, I, yeah. And, and so, you know, that financially, whatever rent, you know, that ashram was paying outside now went in to support what, be, you know, 25 First Avenue and the project there. And yeah. then they had manpower to, to begin to take over, you know, the, the worship of the deities and, you know, kind of bring that, le that level of worship back up. And, you know, on the board of directors, you know, several people stepped onto that board and several of their older people stepped off that board. And within the next couple of years, the entire board of directors, only one person was from that original thing. And so it was really became like our Krishna gave us right. that building in a sense. Right. right. And that's, and that's Maharaja's vision and that's his heart. You know, that's the, you know, they could have turned and given that to anyone. They could have approached anyone. And um, they approached him because because of his genuine Vaishnava uh, relations with them. You know mm -hmm. that's how that's how I understand all that. Um, so then now you have the center itself, but I think it was still a few years before. You know the original vision, which was you know like on one floor there's a temple and then you know and there's kirtan going on, and on another floor there's like a yoga studio and people are taking yoga classes, and on another floor there's a restaurant and. That's that's how we talked about it from the beginning, and that's eventually what manifests. But for that to really manifest, it still took a few more years, I think. And it, it was just a gradual year by year by year working towards that vision of what you, you know, what what's there now. And it, even now it's going through different, you know. <laughs> right. You it's know, always it's like COVID, the Bucky Center COVID is always a, going through some kind of fa different yeah. phases of yeah, and COVID it was is a weird one, right? So yeah. I remember when it went through some really, you know, some really big changes when toward the end of my stay there in 2009, um, I remember Ranath, his only Radha Swami saying that it was like, uh, you know, the Bhakti Center always goes, always goes through this phase of like, 
uh, when 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 something needs to grow properly, Krishna kind of breaks something. Like when you, when you do a <laughs> surgery, when you do like yeah. a, a knee surgery for it to grow properly, sometimes the surgeon has to like break it a little and then it'll grow properly. So he was making that kind of analogy there of the Bhakti Yeah, surgery. he's had a lot of <laughs> important and insightful analogies. <laughs> always, yeah. always. So what was your role there in the beginning? Um, you I know, mean, I remember you. Remember, yeah. I remember you coming around, and and something I really particularly remember was, we would have really crazy. This was like <laughs> seven or something. We'd have really yeah. crazy morning programs. Like, uh, like it was like we were there was like twenty of us, and everyone was in the age range of like twenty five to like twenty seven. Or right, right. I was even younger. I think I was like twenty three or something. And we would have the most crazy guru pujas, like off the wall, like screaming running around and dancing and everything and i remember you had a yoga class at the same time and <laughs> yeah. and, and, and they one time yoga bush would tell us, he's like you guys gotta like really tone it down because kastuba Prabhu is has a yoga class and his yoga students walk through the 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 floor of the temple yeah do you remember that yeah because the temple was on the second floor and the yoga studio is now exactly where rod and morley are on the third floor right right yeah yeah i remember that i'm going to tone it down big time where i was like what what do you mean tone it down like we're having this amazing group <laughs> puja like that is funny time. well you know that, that's an interesting that you say because what, what the most important thing that we can talk about i think in relation to the bhakti centers it's some of the some of the policies that we've developed, you know, um, which which I can talk about in a bit. But, yeah. you know, originally, I, I guess, you know, in one sense, I was a yoga teacher there first, you know, because that's what Maharaj asked me to do. But he also, but I guess I was kind of like uh, one of the people that Maharaj kind of would consult, you know, like allow my opinion to be heard. <laughs> you know, not that sure. it meant that sure. much. But, you know, you know, there's one of the kind of visionaries, I guess, from, <clears throat> from the beginning of it. Um, and then I would say um, after a couple years, I kind of became the program director slash creative director there. Mm -hmm. Meaning I, I helped develop a lot of the programming and then I developed the art and the website and the social media presence and, um, and that kind of thing, which for me, I, I really enjoyed that because it combined my, um, like I didn't know anything about graphic arts or what it means to direct a, be a creative director, but I just, I think my time in Broom Street helped me a lot with that. And just kind of like going around the city and seeing the way things are presented and saying, why don't we present Bhakti that way? You know, like, why can't we, you know, Buddhists are doing this and, you know, go to the Rubin Museum and see how Buddhism is being presented or go, you know, go, go to the, um, Museum of Modern Art and just see how they're presenting things and why can't we try to present Bhakti in something like this, you know? Yeah. So I, I, I really enjoyed, like, I just taught myself Photoshop and just started, you know, creating programs and, um, and, uh, promoting them with, in a visual way, which maybe really wasn't being done before mm -hmm. that. And, uh, so I was, you know, deeply absorbed in the programming of the Bhakti Center for some years, you yeah. know, after that. Um, what were the, what were like the basic yeah. principles that you all decided as the leaders or the kind of the visionaries? Like what was, what was it? For the what, center what itself? Made, yeah. What made it different than like a normal Hare Krishna temple? Okay. Well, well, let me, let me start by saying that from the beginning, Radha Swami was always stressing some things. And I think the staff there, you know, including myself, you know, um, understood it to a certain degree and thought we understood it, but never really understood it as deeply as we needed to understand it. Uh, you know, and, and and so that kind of thing, I think, was holding up. I think it was progressing always, but maybe could have, you know, not as as rapidly as it could. But let me say this from the very beginning. One thing that I always remember Radha Swami stressing was that um, your kirtan, your class, you know, these things are important, but there's things that are more important than that. Um, really, the most important thing is that people get the association of Vaishnavas. Mm. 
and um, and when they get that association, for them to get that association and for them to to feel the benefit of that association, they have to open their heart to it. And for them to be able to open up their heart to it, they have to, f the mood in which they're greeted and the atmosphere in which they're in is really the most important thing. So that means there has to be a lot of consideration in terms of hospitality. Right. And there has to be a lot of consideration in terms of how the devotees themselves relate to one another in the mood that is existing within that family, right? Like, in other words, if people walk in that door and they feel like everybody here is so nice and I can genuinely see that these people, you know, like um, they're relating on a higher level than, than when I go to work or when I go to school or wherever I go, that these people have a, there's, there's a special affection and love amongst them. Uh, it, it's all meaningful because it's centered around this deeply spiritual, you know, it's within this deeply spiritual context, but the, 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 their association is, is special. And, and, uh, and, I, and I can walk in the door and, and uh, be greeted well and, and feel very comfortable. Like he, he was always telling us the importance of this, wow. but it took, it took years for it to really begin to manifest. And, and I think that is part of what, makes the bhakti center different from like let's say a lot of other centers is like you walk into the bhakti center and the first thing is there's a there's a desk with people there that are smiling at you and saying how can i help you right you don't you know to this day is it like that in most you know iskon centers there's a you desk know? but there's no one there <laughs> okay there may be a desk <laughs> yeah but there's nobody there and so you know the idea was you could walk in the bhakti center at any time and and yeah and you know so that was part of what made it different. But I think uh, obviously another part was like the Bhakti Center, you know, before COVID set in and now it's just coming out of it and beginning to get back on its feet. And, you know, a lot of the staff, it did, you know, moved on in different, you know, in different ways. And uh, so it, it's, it's in a rebuilding period. It developed online during that period. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's just starting to reopen again. Um, but before COVID, you know, in that center, I think, I think um, there were not counting like the the traditional like temple programs like Mangalarti and Guru Puja and, and those kind of things. But like, I think we do over three thousand events in a year, like three thousand. You know, like that means like nine a day, I think, or so, an average wow. of nine or day programs. Like whether they're yoga classes or meditation classes or shastra classes you know bhagavad gita talks or um, sound baths we have whatever you know it's like it was about like yeah. nine different things going on there in a day and you know these are being presented you know in a different style you know online and through social media that people could connect to and pop in there you know come in for a meditation class or come in for a yoga class or you know which um it certainly is very different, you know, than a, a center that just has like a Sunday feast and maybe one other program in the week or something like that. So yeah. it was designed to be a cultural center to have a lot going on like that. Uh, so that, you know, that's part of what made it different. Um, but you asked about um, like, what did the leaders establish to make it, you know, I, I want to- Some of the principles. Some of the principles. Yeah. And, and I'll say this is that, you know, the Bhakti Center went through and continues to go through different, uh, stages of leadership but i think there was a really um w one of the periods there because i've been there since the beginning that that a real a lot generated you know like a, a po real powerful steps uh uh forward there were always steps forward you know being taken and and, and i really I, I appreciate and i respect everybody that has ever served there yeah. um but I'd say when Vera Budget just came on, like especially the first couple of years, they, they, those those couple of years I think were very dynamic in terms of some things that developed. Yeah. And one of them, because before that, the I would say that um, there are different dynamic people, but they weren't working together. Always, it was like different people with different visions, you know, kind of like working in the same building. Right. And uh, from the beginning, what Vera did was he took leaders from all those different things and put put us all together, and we began to work together on a vision uh, for the Bhakti Center. And that not only did it um, 
not only was it a great opportunity to go back to what Radha Swami had been always telling us all along, that it really when you have this family kind of unity there, it makes all the difference. So by bringing people together like that and and us having to work together, what it did was it, it did break down whatever, you know, everyone has assumptions in their mind about people and where they're at and why they're doing what they're doing and so on. So it was really a chance to break down those barriers and understand one another. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, it was a good way to, to kind of generate ideas, you know, to, 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 you had different people with different backgrounds and, and, and together to generate ideas. So one thing that we developed out of there was called the Bhakti Center's Playbook, which was, you know, a, a group of us sitting together and kind of grinding through a process, you know, what is the vision? What is the purpose? What are our values? You know, um, what are the strategic anchors and what are different goals you know like for instance just having what was called a thematic goal like that at any period of time and you know this was working for some time i'm not saying that the body centers like work perfectly functioning according to this but like <laughs> but at least we got it started and it's there and it could be regenerated again you know but like that org at one point it was like there's a thematic goal what is the goal of what is the most important uh goal to this for this center at this moment, you know, like for the next three months or next six months, what are we focused on? What is the one thing that if we get this done, we're going to feel good. Like we've taken a step forward. And if we don't get it done, we're kind of spinning our wheels and everyone in the organization should know that. And, um, and there should be a focus on achieving that. So like just having a thematic goal, like is, is a big thing, but I think maybe one of the most important things was the core values. And, uh, you, there's there's different ways that an organization can, can de develop its core values, look at them and, and try. But the way that we did it was we looked at Radha Swami's character himself. And we said, what is it about this person that's unique and that attracts us and so many other people to Bhakti? And maybe right. we can kind of make those the values of our, what, what values does he embody? And maybe we can make those values, the value, you know, the values of the center. And so we developed three core values, and, and these were important to us. I think anything out, out of the playbook, these were the most dynamic in their application. And there were three that we came up with. They were called firmly rooted, branching out, and bound together. And what they mean was firmly rooted means, I'm going to read it to you straight from the playbook. It says firmly sure. rooted is with firmly rooted with faith and loyalty to the bhakti tradition of Sri Chaitanya as taught and exemplified by Srila Prabhupada. Now, every word here is significant, you know, like, right. um, but that's kind of like the conservative side, you know, because the Bhakti Center by nature is meant to be a um, innovative kind of outreach project. But innovative outreach, pro outreach projects, you know, they're, they're prone to kind of like lose their footing, you know? Yeah. And, and so um, that firmly rooted, again, with faith and, lo faith and loyalty, to the bhakti tradition of Sri Chaitanya as taught and exemplified by Srila Prabhupada. And then branching out is like the, the, the more innovative side, you know, um, through a culture of inclusion, seeing every soul is important in Krishna's service and reaching out with non-judgmental compassion and thoughtfulness to make the message of bhakti relevant and accessible. So the balance of those two, you know, we saw in say in Radha Swami's character, Right, like in one sense, he's like a, you know a hardcore sannyasi that sleeps on the floor. That's you know you you ask him to give a class on you know Rasikananda or what, what you know he'll he'll go into like great detail and depth because he's he's so deeply imbibed that tradition. Yeah, but on the other hand, you know, like he, he'll sit down, you know, at a you know. Um, with a, a a Western yoga teacher or a, a rainbow festival person, whatever it is, and show them respect, you know, and and a type of kindness, um, or he'll speak to them in ways that are less traditional that will make more sense to them or be more accessible to them. Right. So that balance of firmly rooted and branching out became very important because it's like, who do you allow to live in the ashram? Well, what we're looking for is people that can understand and embody both of these. Some people may, and a great devotee may be just like entirely firmly rooted, but not so, you know, developed on the branching outside. Mm -hmm. And they may be an incredibly wonderful Vaishnava, 
but they might not work in that place. They may not fit into that place. Um, yeah. and, and it will create tension and, and so on. Or, or vice versa. Someone may be completely innovative and dynamic and creative, but they may be missing or, uh, or maybe missing an, a certain level of appreciation for that more conservative or traditional side. And so the balance of those two became really important. Um, and the third one bound together is with the understanding that all of our offerings rest on the foundation of the first and most fundamental offering of our own cooperation based on shared love, trust, honesty, and care for each other. So those, th those became the, you know, the, the values of the Bhakti Center. And I think, you know, it can, I'm not so, I have no kind of executive role at the Bhakti Center, you know, for some time now, and I'm not so hands-on there. Um, but I think these are still alive and, you know, they can always be more alive and, you know, more dynamic, but I think to this day, they're, they're important there. So Definitely. that was one, yeah, that, that's one thing was that playbook. And, and I would say there are two other things that became important, at least in my mind, sure. was the, the programming strategy. Um, and another, um, you could call it the, the style guide or the, the brand identity guidelines. Mm. You know, how we present ourselves you know i can go into a lot of detail i don't know if you have if i should just go on, Wait, on about these no things. no you i i'd like you to describe those two uh, other things i just want to make an observation that yeah. i'm i'm seeing that there's a lot of emphasis put on the presentation and yeah the way, the way that it's perceived even from like the way it's when you're walking down the street, the way the signage is or the way that it looks, the colors, the logo, all that stuff is, is it seemed like from what you're telling me, a very, a lot of thought went in, into it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's more like the style guide kind of stuff. Right. In other words, right. I'll share something about that is. Is that, like, is that like a New York thing? Is like, is that the reason? Like, because it's because it's, cause it, it's so aesthetically, it's important. People find aesthetics important. Anyway, yeah, I'll sure. let you describe the, that style guide. Well, I'll tell you something. My thoughts were like this. I give a lot of classes outside of the Bhakti Center. Yeah. Um, you know, I do colleges or um, yoga teacher trainings, things like that. And what I found was, and, you know, I also have worked a lot with Raghunath over the years, too. So, you know, but not only Raghunath, you know, so many people, Gauravani, Janavi, Radhana Swami himself. And, but what I found was any of those people or, or in my own life, I found that, like, for instance, I feel like I could walk into any yoga studio in America or any college in America. I practically feel like I could walk almost anywhere in America. If you set up a group of people for, to listen to me, I feel yeah. like I can present Bhakti in a way that will, for some people in that audience, they're gonna say, this makes a lot of sense. I wanna know more about this. That's right? huge, that's huge. Yeah, yeah, and, and but then the question is, well, why aren't these people pouring through our doors? <laughs> you know, like right. if there's right. a lot of people that want what we've got, then why aren't these people, why aren't more people coming? And you can say, you know, in some ways the Bhakti Center is like you go to a Thursday night Kirtan, you get 150 people in there on any given Thursday or something like that. I mean, in one sense, that's pretty good. But in another sense, it's like, this is New York City and there should be like, you know, like... Per square mile, know, there's like... 1,500 or 15,000 people that are showing up for, you know, <laughs> for, for programs like this. You know, so right. in one sense, it's nothing. It, it's, a, it's a drop that we can learn something from, you know, but uh, how, how to expand it. And what and what is it that's preventing someone? And and that there can be so many reasons and and so many different ways to promote what we're doing and bring it to to the attention of more people. But still, you know, why someone's going to go to our website? They're going to look at it. They're going to think about it, and then they're not going to come. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm. Uh, you know, that's the impression that I got. And so one year, I forget what year it was. It was maybe twenty. 15 or something like that, 16, maybe something like that. I, um, Raghunath and I were doing a, a, you know, a training at the Eco Village. And one of the people, one of Raghunath's students that came there was a absolutely fantastic guy. You know, uh, he, he's like a vice president. I didn't know this. All I knew was that he, um, all I knew was that he worked at an, at a, at an adver advertising agency. Oh, interesting. But he was a very, he's a very classy uh, man, very intelligent, Bengali, 
uh, but but you know, living in the West for a very long time. Uh, friendly, uh, you know, he, and he became a Bhagavad Gita student of mine in that training, and and we connected. You know, there's a mutual respect between us. And so when when that was like in January, probably 2016, and and when I came back from India that year, I said, you know, the, the exact thing that I brought up to you is like, if there's so many people out there that relate to what we're saying, why aren't more of them coming through our doors? And um, so Vera and I said, why don't we why don't we reach out to different people that have some experience in um in in that kind of world, and see if they can give us some advice. Right. And so I called up this was person I called, he was one of the people that I reached out to, and basically I was just like and say, can we ask you a few questions? And he said, why don't you bring your people down to our offices? And then what I began to realize was he was the vice president of like a powerful you know advertising award-winning advertising agency and i got to their offices it was like you know like you know mind-blowing place and, and and he brought to that meeting um the creative director and um and part owner of of the entire firm wow. and this was a woman very nice woman again i have you know a close i have a very you know a uh, nice relationship with her to this day uh, she listens to Wisdom of the Sages and, and comes to different retreats and stuff that we do. And um, the two of them, I tell you something, I haven't described the programming strategy, but the programming strategy is something that we grinded for weeks and weeks after years of being at the Body Center, you know, like a group of us like churning and churning and, and boiling it down to we had something that we really felt made sense. And when we showed it to Radha Swami, he was just over the moon about it. He was like, this is what you need to do. Just focus on this. Right. So I haven't told you about that yet, but we walked into there. They put us in an office. They asked us questions for 10 minutes. And then this man got up and, and on a whiteboard drew out practically verbatim our exact programming strategy, you know, and I was like, even though he didn't know it, he, you didn't tell, tell it to him. No, we didn't tell him a thing. And he actually drew it out like in in wow. like in surprisingly similar detail <laughs> and imagery <laughs> as we did. I was like, whoa, you know. Um, so so in any case, uh, we what they did for us was they kind of took us on pro bono and took us through a, a branding kind of um exercise mm -hmm. where they interviewed about 60 people who attend the Bhakti Center and they interviewed them from all different angles, like you know, like one group of people, they just had a list of questions, you know, and they, they called them on the phone and asked them these questions. And another group of people, they had them do this exercise, like throughout the day, from the moment that you wake up to the end of the day, every time you think about the Bhakti Center, I want you to write down what you thought and what made you think it or something like that, you know. And then they had another way, I think they had three different ways of, of kind of drawing information from these people. And then they just added it all up and they presented it to us. Um, and it was it was very interesting. They they found that there are two things that that made people keep coming to the Bhakti Center, made them really appreciate the Bhakti Center. And they said it was a combination of the two things that rose to the top. And they said very prominently, like they they rarely would get such kind of like a a clear reading mm -hmm. from different organizations that they work with. But they said the two things are a very a sense of authentic learning like these people are actually rooted in their tradition and they know what they're talking about and they mm. and you can really learn something from these people and the other thing was a warm family atmosphere they said it was these two things that that make you unique you know and and, and then they presented um what they call positioning like what what is your place in the marketplace like what is it that you do best that nobody else can do like you do and you have and they said you have to establish what that is and put that out there you have to establish what your position is other if you don't establish it clearly then it gets established for you oh. and, and 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 people don't really understand who you are or what you are so so that's that's marketing you know I, i'm no marketing expert anything, but that's how they explained it to us you need to you need to present it and so then they had a meeting where they presented to us three different potential uh, marketing positions and um they were interesting the first one I, I think was called authentic yoga uh and and they explained what that was um i can pull it up maybe real yoga and um it says there's an actionable opportunity there is an 
I won't read it all. It's too detailed, but it was more something like, um, we have authentic yoga here. You right. Know? And then the, the second one was called spiritual home. And basically what that meant was the combination of those two. It says the product offers a shared guided practice rooted in yoga concepts and traditions. And the customer promises a social and spiritual anchor that supports a lifetime of learning. Um, and then the third one was called Grace Through Devotion. And the product offer there is community-based devotional practice steeped in tradition of bhakti. And the customer promises find a state of grace through opening your heart to a higher power. Now, they said you have to choose one of these. You can't choose two. You got to choose one. Someone should be able to go to your website, look at it, and in 10 seconds or less, understand who you are. Yeah, who you are and what you're all about. And so um, we chose option two, which was spiritual home. Right. That's one of, that's the logo, right? I mean, not that, the logo. We built the, it into like our tagline. Yeah. Tagline, yeah. right. Yeah. And so, so, um, which is interesting because you see what I, what I realized and what they helped me realize and it helped us realize was that really what we had been presenting was grace through devotion. And Grace through devotion is actually our central thing. It's like really we're trying to bring people ultimately, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily the most marketable thing. It's not exactly what people are looking for. We have a lot of what people are looking for, but they're really not looking for a religious experience. But in a lot of ways, that's what kind of what we're putting out there. Like if you, if you would have looked at our website, then probably the first image you see is like, like hundreds of people with their arms up in the air in the temple, like, like this, you know, like, like this or something, right. which is kind of like a religious image, you know, like the grace is descending and, and you know, right? right. Right. Um, where like something like spiritual home and, in 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 all that it meant was, it was more like, oh, I'm learning something there. I'm learning something valuable, some wisdom about life, something that I can apply in my life and, and transform my life. And, and I'm looking for that. So it's not that it, it was, um, dishonest or something like that you know we do have a, a warm atmosphere and we do feel it's your place to come and experience some spiritual transformation but if what we put forward is grace through devotion you're just going to limit the amount of people that can eventually get to grace by devotion you know mm. and so to me that was really important and that kind of from that point we began to develop the branding around that and you know develop the logo around that develop our language, you know, the copy, you know, like how we describe our different programs and so on. So all of that became important. There's a lot of thought that that went into uh, how do we want to present ourselves? You know, like what kind of language do we want to use? I, I, if you go to our st uh, our style guide, like it'll say, like what is our tone and the tone that we want to strike in all of our present, you know, like in in, in our promotional materials, you know. And that was a combination of, we wanted on one hand to be like, feel professional, feel refined and experienced and consistent and trustworthy and organized and, and mature and competent. We want people to walk in there and feel like they're not in some kind of, they're in a real organization that's got its act together, <laughs> you know, right. um, that, that, that qualified people that, that have organizations like that themselves and, and that are together in their lives could walk in that place, and, which is not necessarily going to be what you experience when you walk into every ISCON center. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and then, but then another part of the tone was offbeat creativity. That's just how we defined it. Offbeat creativity, young, dynamic, organic, grassroots, energetic, conscientious, do it yourself, edgy, courageous like that, you know, like, and that's something of the flavor of the neighborhood, you know, that we're in and then authentic, which is again, firmly rooted, in, you know, timeless wisdom that we're presenting it's relevant it's substantial it's it's something real it's not something that we just whipped up but we're connected to an authentic tradition and then ultimately family that it, there should be a sense of that family that 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 warmth of the place and, and that be you know that's the tone that we try to present in, in in whatever it is that we're presenting out there and again reflected through the imagery and so on you should you should look at the website and, and feel okay the, the place has got its act together you know but it seems kind of cool too you know yeah uh, and it seems to be real it's for real there's there, it's something authentic and, and, and real going right so like that's kind of you know and it's warm you know you can so that's you know so now you have your tone and 
and and you try to present that in everything. So all those, you know, that's all that stuff is there's a, as you said, there's a lot of thought that went into it. I guess a question I would have is how do you balance the presentation or kind of these these things that you can control in the sense of the way it's perceived as opposed to what we hear of Krishna conscious, like bhakti comes from bhakti. So you can have all these things, but if you don't have any substantial bhakti, then that can't really affect someone. So how do you balance, like for those of our listeners who, I know there's tons of devotees who are like, I want to start something similar to the bhakti center, or we want to make our center similar to that. How do we balance those two things, or how did you balance those two things when you when this was like in its visionary stage, or kind of even further than that? But balancing the 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 the, the substantial bhakti part, and then the part where it's like, okay, this is how it's perceived. Okay, yeah, I mean, what you're saying is so important, and again, I think that any any organization that's trying to be innovative, there's always going to be a tension, and, and there's always going to be the risk of losing touch with your roots. Right, your 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 real substance is this all just flash? Is this all just imagery, or is there substance there? And if that substance not there, <clears throat> I have no interest, you know, in in um, spending all this energy on it, you know, right. and, and and it can easily be lost, and, and that that's part of the reason why that firmly rooted and and um, branching out is there. Like we can't lose touch with our these roots, you know, otherwise. Yeah you know we can get you know great if we can get hundreds of people to come to yoga classes but if they're not actually connecting to sri chaitanya's bhakti you know um tradition then they can go to yoga class anywhere right um and, and so you know that part part of it there's many ways that we would try to guard against that or let's say like um operate so that that's not an issue one of his one thing that we did with the leaders at one point was it, it kind of just because <laughs> everything is so hard in this world, you know, with our schedules and everything. But we had all the leaders, you know, we said we need to hear and chant together. Wow. And so we said, and, and we said, let's all just make a commitment. We'll all come to Thursday night kirtan. So we'll chant together. And wow. and then we'd all get together and read Chaitanya Charge and we'd read some Shastra together. And, you know, we also set up that Bhagavad Shravana program which is also like a chance to get together and let's read Bhagavatam together. And, and both of those are potent. You know, the Bhagavad Shravana was potent and, and, and the Thursday Night Kirtan was potent. Of course, you played a big role in Thursday Night Kirtan, so you know that. Right. Um, and so if your leaders are hearing and chanting together, that's is what Prabhupada told us. To do. He said that's how, you know, follow the, the regulative principles and hear and chant, and and then Krishna will inspire you how to spread bhakti. So so that's, you know, that's the essentials. That's the kind of stuff that we we have to do. That adherence to the to the to the you know the deep rooted principles, and then at the same time that outreach the those two are just like the way it was are the way you articulated it in that uh, in those you know those three things values yeah core values, values is so important in a in a temple because I, I mean. I mean it goes without saying it just those those two things are very important and then it becomes that. Uh, you are being progressive and you are being with the times, but at the same time, you're having that really deep spiritual root. Yeah. Eventually. yeah. Um, it's so easy to let it slip. Yeah, definitely. I, I guess a, a practical question that um, was that a lot of devotees I've also heard ask, like, what was it, what was it around like being it stamped ISKCON or not? What was the story? Is there a story behind that? Is it going to be someday? Or what was the, how did that go? Um, the way that that worked was, of course, the center itself was not, was a legally not ISKCON, right? It was it was an offshoot of New Vrindavan that created its own incorporation, its own uh, um What's the word I'm looking for? Techno, you know, um, I'm trying to think of the legal term, but uh, <laughs> I'm so LLC bad or something. Yeah, well, yeah. What is that? LLC. Yeah, like or well, like no, a like uh, I'm trying to think of the tax. You know, the the. the oh, oh, okay. I see. For religious, 
yeah, yeah one yeah. something K or some, some yeah, letter, yeah. numbers and a, and a letter. <laughs> yeah, I'm so bad. I can't believe that I can't <laughs> pull it up right now. But you know, Acts, it was a Acts religious three. organization. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and so, but so legally, it was an ISKCON. Although it had these deities that were from ISKCON, right? But in one sense, when when New Vrindavan was excommunicated from ISKCON, then in one sense, the the the, the deity worships now the care of those deities is no longer within the the the, the, the jurisdiction of ISKCON. And mm -hmm. it was like that for a long time. So Radha Murlidar, you know, um, were there. Um, and uh, when 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 the, those devotees invited you know, our group of devotees to come in and take part. Again, it was like, it was just kind of more like a, there was one law, legal challenge that was put forward. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it didn't have really any um, substance to it. In other words, some people were claiming ownership of it. But, right. But they, and, and um, but so, but that didn't work. And, and so now legally, it was still this other organization on paper. But really much, pretty much everyone that was participating was like, for, you know, more or less an ISKCON member, if you want to use that kind of term, you know, yeah. uh, at least, you know, certainly in, in, in you know, at heart. Um, so I think it's always been the, the intention of Radha Swami that, you know, and the board of directors that eventually it would become part of ISKCON. But at the same time, there's, we wanted to keep are we were hesitant to kind of just jump under the management that was within New York at the time, whether it was on the GBC level or the temple level in right. order to be innovative and to do the things that we wanted to do. It was helpful to have the freedom you know, to do it. And I don't think those issues are, are very prominent anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. They, they weren't the past. So there was just that kind of, there was a tension there a while. What we tried to do was just be very cooperative as far as possible and, and, um, with whatever ISKCON entities were in New York at the time. Uh, but we kind of kept our independence, you know. Yeah. I'd imagine somewhere down the road, it'll eventually legally kind of unite. Sure, sure. I mean, it's made up with all of, of all ISKCON devotees. So it yeah. would just be like a legal thing, yeah. yeah. Um, maybe I want to talk, before I, we go into like what you're doing now, yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about maybe some challenges or things to look out for, for devotees who want to do something progressive okay. or something similar. There, and there's one other thing I think I should mention before we move on to is just at least something briefly about the programming strategy. Yeah, yeah, I think please. particularly relevant. Should I do that first? And then, and then uh, we'll programming take strategy. Yeah, yeah, we didn't okay. get into that. Yeah, let's do that first. So th the programming strategy there was like... Um, it, again, it was a group of devotees that just kind of grinded through this for some time, and 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 I felt really got the certain blessings that it all just kind of—it's not a big deal, but it, it kind of clicked and was like this, yes, this. And uh, I won't describe the whole thing, but I'll just describe maybe a, maybe one or two of the most important aspects of it. Sure. And it's real simple, but I think. Um, if a, if an organization that's trying to present bhakti considers this, it can be very valuable. And maybe the most important part of it is that we conceive of our programming in three rings. Outer ring, inner ring, and core. Right? That like if a program is going to be put on at the bhakti center, we should understand exactly who it's directed at. Outer ring, inner ring, or core. So we define those uh, in, in a particular way. And that is outer ring pro each one has a certain audience. Each program has a certain audience, a certain goal, and a certain strategy. And so for outer ring programs, the audience is it's it's a program that's especially geared towards visitors. If someone walked in off the street and didn't know anything about Bhakti, Hare Krishna, anything, this program is geared for their understanding. Now, the strategy is that it should be completely relevant and understandable and approachable for these people and with a strong focus on hospitality and follow-up, right? Someone walks in the door, I don't know anything about this, or someone brings a friend in there for the first time. They don't know our lingo. They don't know. We're not going to use any of that. We're not, we're, 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 um, we're going to present everything so that they can totally understand it. And the goal of the program is that the person feels inspired by what we're presenting 
and that they appreciate it and that they want to come back. And if someone feels like that, then, then that program was successful, right? Now, in a ring, the audience is it's especially geared for regular guests, people that have been coming for a while that are beginning to identify with, with the practice, with the people. And the strategy is to provide quality systematic education with care and attention uh, from teacher to student. It's a chance to develop teacher-student relationships. And it's a chance to, to, to give people more deep depth of information and understanding or practice of whatever it may be. And, um, and the goal here is to deepen education and training and to develop teacher-student connection. So like an outer ring program could be, you, you, you know, it could be a yoga class. It could be a meditation class. It could be a Bhagavad Gita class, but yeah. it, it's not going to be the kind of same Bhagavad Gita class you're going to give to someone that's been practicing Bhakti for 20 years. It's not going to use l lingo that that person may already be familiar with and concepts that that person is already, it's going to explain it in a language that they can understand. Mm -hmm. it, and even, you know, well, let me, let me give the core one and then I'll show how this kind of plays out. Core means the audience is, it's geared towards um, dedicated followers. People that say, this is my faith. This is what I practice. This is what I want to develop. I want to, I want to be a Gaudiya Vaishnava. I want to, you know, I, I want to follow in the line of Shri Prabhupada and Acharyas and so on. And the, the goal is to provide a network of care to facilitate a lifelong commitment to, to bhakti, to devotional service. And the strategy was three, kind of three pronged, sadhana, sangha, and seva, right? That we do all that we can for that audience to provide opportunities to deepen their sadhana, feel inspired in their sadhana, um, to have a good association, you know, regular, good, solid association in their life, and that they get some service, that they actually feel I'm contributing in a particular way. So mm -hmm. that's a whole nother kind of program. Like it's common if you walk into most ISKCON centers, you know, like the Sunday feast is like their outreach program in one sense, but usually it's all core people there and the class is spoken to them. And, and, and I understand it has to be spoken to them because they're not going to feel inspired. But now you've got people walking into an atmosphere that's very foreign to them, hearing a talk that they may not really understand. And so you're, you're, you're blending your audiences and you're maybe not getting the best effect right. now I'll, I'll share i'll share something like that helped us apply that how how one practical way like this becomes applied and that was thursday night kirtan because if you look at our thursday night, our thursday night kirtan was and is um our most attended regular program right again it was getting 150 or more people on any given thursday night two hour kirtan um in a temple and, you know, at a certain point, we were able to get, you know, because you have a front desk and because people are checking in when they come in, you can start to take statistics. You can see how many new people are there, how many of those new people came back, you know. And we found that we we're getting a lot of people coming new, but most of them weren't coming back. Oh. Right. So why is that? You know, like, what is it about? Then you have to consider what is it about the experience? Let me put myself in their shoes. And what is it like to walk in here? You know, I walk into this place and it's very crowded. It's one thing. It's in a temple. Now, for a lot of people, it's like, oh, this place is beautiful. But for a lot of other people, they might not think that way. They might think, what is going on here? <laughs> you know, like, what, what is this, you know, worship ceremony that I'm watching, you know? And a lot of people are coming in there because they're anticipating a meditative kind of experience. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Not like wampers, like blah, blah, blah. Yeah, exactly. You know, you got three Merdungas going in there and you got like this intense, you know, like people just get going wild. And then, you know, right. and, 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 uh, and that's our core experience, you know, like that's part of that's our core, core experience. Yes. yes. Um, so so it, was, it was simultaneously our biggest outreach regular program. And, but it was very much a core program, you know, in, in its setting, in, in its atmosphere and so on. It's long, you know, it's kind of two hours. That might be a, a bit of a stretch for a new person to walk into. Yeah. You know, then we serve a whole feast afterward, which in one sense is a wonderful thing, but for other people, it's like, you know, more than they bargained for perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh. So then, you know, some devotees there developed. Janavi was involved. Jai Jagannath was involved. Uh, 
I think Jagiri Dari was, in, uh, you know, there's a whole team. Yeah. And they developed Tuesday Night Kirtan. Tuesday Night Kirtan was only one hour long. Tuesday Night Kirtan was not held in the temple. It was held in another nice room. Uh, Tuesday Night Kirtan, the idea was it would be a much more meditative kind of Kirtan. You know, it was like Thursday Night Kirtan is bringing Kirtan leaders from all over the place. And you, you're a Kirtan leader. You can't I can't tell you how to chant. Right? It's like <laughs> Kirtan leaders chant the way they want to chant. You can right. try to tell, even if you tell them, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I get it, I get it. But once they get going, they're just going to go where they go. Right. You know, so this was like a limited team, you know, that had like a particular mission to like present Kirtan in a particular way that, that, that would be in a more meditative, you know, kind of uh, way. And, um, and the, it, there wasn't a feast afterwards, it was just kind of like hors d'oeuvres kind of served out and, you know, you can talk and, and so on. And also the Kirtan was presented with just a bit of explanation, you know, the, okay, this is sure. what we're doing here today, you know, and so on. And so that became a really successful program. You know, that the, the, the Thursday night Kirtan was getting, you know, again, over 150 people. That program was getting like 60, 65 people or so, you know, like every Tuesday, um, but getting people that were coming back now, right? This is what they were looking for. This is what they feel they could bring their friend to or, you know, or, or bring their family to or whatever. Um, and then those people would graduate to going to the Thursday Night Kirtan. You know, oh, there's another thing going, yeah, that's a little different, you know, but yeah, you could check that one out too if you want. But already, you know, they, they, they their, their entry hasn't been like, um, too challenging for them right it was they, like they got, zero to 60 and you know exactly two seconds. exactly yeah yeah so right. i think that that idea of like trying to understand like trying to make your presentation geared towards particular audiences is something that's very valuable it's a very valuable concept um if you're trying to if you have a center and you're trying to present not even even just that but just the more that you can think like that who am i speaking to right now What's the goal of my communication right now? Right. Then, you know, that, that can be really helpful. So I just wanted to put that out there. There's more to the programming strategy than that, but maybe that's the most important part of it. That's brilliant. I think that's just this, this past, you know, this conversation is very valuable because it's kind of giving a, a behind the scenes look at all the thought that went into what became the Bucky Center and what attracted so many people to it. And actually now very, so many committed members came from that and it's yeah. very valuable information. When um, we brought that to Radha Swami, he was, yeah. I, I, he, he really, you know, it was presented in, um, we Vera and I were meant to present it to him together in Mumbai, but something happened with Vera, his, whatever transportation he was taking was like really delayed or whatever. So I showed it to Maharaj just by myself. But he was just like, he said, this is it. You know, if you just do this, you know, uh, it, uh, of course, I have to say a, a lot of the rest of the strategy had to do with hospitality and and, and, and yes. organizing ourselves to care for each individual. That, that was a real important part of it. Um, but he said, just if you just do this, you know, this will, this will really um, be very successful. And, and what you're saying is, yeah, all that thought that that went into it was important because it also helped develop the relationships, you know, that we did that work together and we, you know, um, it builds a sense of trust. I'll say, I'll share another thing about that bound together, mm -hmm. you know, which is the third of our core values is that within that organization or any good organization, you really have to be able to speak your mind, disagree and, and learn how to disagree with each other. Um, and still remain friends and, and come to deeper understandings of where each other are at. Um, and usually that doesn't happen. That takes a lot of maturity, you know, for, for an organization to get on that level. Usually organizations don't get on that level, even within yeah. our, even within Vaishnava organization and so on. It's, it's hard. It's hard work. Yeah. Um, it takes examples of humility and tolerance to kind of, you know, and Radha Swami to me has always, and, and I think for the Bhakti Center, you know, in, in general, has always been that example. And we always felt that, you know, if we're bickering or fighting amongst ourselves, we can't stand in front of him, you know, because it's just like, you know, so, so that, you know, it says in the Yoga Sutras that for one who fully embodies ahimsa, that no kind of like ahimsa can really exist in their, in their, domain you know mm. and this is part of how i understand it that when you really when you when you really have a depth of 
compassion and mature, mature compassion. And when you embody mature compassion, then those pe people around you respect that. And they also begin to get that they need to embody that when they're around you, meaning, yeah. meaning how they associate with other people when they're around you. They can no longer have some kind of, I don't know if him sick is a word, but you know, like, you know, some element of discord within their own character. You know, they have to begin to go deeper into their spiritual life and see the good in others and become tolerant of other views and be open to having their own views shaped and so on. And so Radha Swami's presence, uh, it, it, there's, there's no price you can put on it. You know, yeah. that's, it's rare that someone embodies that so deeply so that it spreads throughout an organization. Yeah. And, you know, and, and so, so that's, that's certainly real, real important, but, but again, our, our working together to come to the, all the thought that was going into it, not only was it valuable in terms of like, say strategy, but it was also valuable working together just to know each other and understand each other and serve together, you know, that it became important for that reason too. And I remember there were you, the leaders and the staff, they would always, not always, but regularly go on retreats together, whether it was upstate, yep. spending time with each other to, I think that's so, so valuable when you're serving alongside someone, but then you go and you change the environment to somewhere else, able, you're able to, you know, spend time with each other. This, this was even during the time of Yogi Purush Prabhu's you know, the, to, the to, to, amongst his brahmacharis, it was. Yeah, I think yeah. at that point, amongst the brahm, not amongst the larger, right. At one point, it wasn't much more than the brahmacharis. Right, right, right but, yeah. it was. But and, I remember and, it being like that. Yeah, yeah, and you know, uh, so much credit has to go to you know these two couples, you know, Virabhadra and his wife Diana, and yeah. you know her sister Shama and her husband and Vera's friend Jai. You know, but um, to have a team of four people right living in the building who already work so well together and love each other and inspired by maharaj to see you know usually most organizations you talk about that kind of thing but then it kind of gets sidelined and uh you know it, it drops off because other things seem more important or pressing mm -hmm. but maharaj kind of instilled them in the idea that this is what's most important and most pressing <laughs> You know, is that yeah. everyone really begin to operate like a family? So they would do all kind of things like, um, you know, have I think once a week would be like a pancake, you know, breakfasts for for wow. everyone, and maybe once a month they would invite more people for a dinner, and we would do like picnics in the park together, not just for the staff, but that would involve like other people. All of those things, you know, the importance of those kind of things. Like for instance, say you're coming to the Bhakti Center or whatever center. And you're getting into bhakti and it's making it's clicking in your life and it's making sense but you're you have like a a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a, a husband or a wife yeah and they don't know anything about it you know the, and your your whole life is changing and you're going through all this stuff and like they're still exactly where they are and you know and then you need to be able to bring them into it somehow where at least they don't feel like it's weird or crazy or bizarre Mm. so like if you bring them to a sunday feast or whatever it, that might not work but if you can bring them to a picnic where those same people are just hanging out like casual and just yeah. friendly and you can see that these are cool people i can relate to these people they're normal mm. and they got a great atmosphere like they got a great thing going on here like they're they're you know they, they love each other and, and there's yeah. a nice community here you know that's a huge th you can't underestimate that like that's a huge you know that that's that opens a door for so many more people, not only for those spouses or, or boyfriends or girlfriends or family members or whatever, but even for the person that's getting into it, you know, because at a certain point that tension is going to build where they may break their association and, 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 and let go of their practice to preserve what relationships they have from, you know, from previous to that. Yeah. So all those things are really, you know, they can't, it, like you said, you can't, you can get so into that that you lose what you're trying to do. And maybe, so maybe this is a segue into the question that you asked me, like, what things do you have to be careful about? Yeah. And um, generally when, when you're doing something innovative, you have an, it's done by people that have an inspiration for it. And they have a strong inspiration for it. Um, and it's in response to something that they feel could be done better. 
And so I'd say, let, maybe there's two things I would say. The first one is that it's, 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 um, it's not only easy, but it's likely to some degree going to happen somewhere down the road where you begin to wonder in the name of making this accessible and relatable, are we losing the essence of what we're trying to do? Right. You know, that, that, that will always come up and, and, you know, in one sense it's our job to push the envelope a little bit, you know, to, 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 you know, to, to, to stretch it a little bit and see, and, and in order to do that, you need to have some people in that organization that really embody the Bhakti tradition and really understand it, who have been to Vrindavan and met the sadhus and been trained under them. And, you know, and, and, and that, that um, experience has to be honored. You know, it has to be honored by the leaders in the organization, it has to be honored by, and the staff has to get it too. That's, that'll be the anchor. Even if those people don't fully understand the innovation, you know, um, that, that firmly rooted quality has to be understood as essential. Otherwise we just, we have no, we're rudderless and we just, we, we do lose the essence. So that's one thing. And I think the other one, uh, it also very important, maybe even most important is that in one's innovation, that one doesn't become critical of those that aren't doing it in their way or aren't on, or aren't understanding their way. Super um, important. It, it's, it, 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 if, if you develop pride, if you, um, if you offend genuine Vaishnavas in your efforts to be innovative, all the blessings, <laughs> you know, that, 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 that you know, in, in order to truly represent, you know, you lose them. Yeah. And, uh, even you might create a fancy shell that looks, you know, that looks nice and attractive or whatever, you know, underneath that true substance, you know, it won't be there. And, and I think, um, it's an essential part of our culture. There, there are, there are aspects of Vaishnava culture. There are lines that you don't cross. Um, you know, f even just ideas like for a junior devotee, they don't criticize senior devotees. They don't do it. <laughs> you know, I, ca I can't stand, in, I can't stand in front of our Goswamis um, as, as one of their followers. I can't present myself to them as their follower if I'm behaving in that way. Mm. And, and, and so those, those lines become, you know, really important. And, and uh, they're not just um, arbitrary uh, etiquette rules, but they're, they're safeguards of true bhakti, you know, mm. and, and uh, whether it be for the individual or for the organization, uh, they're real important. That, that Vaishnava culture really has to be there. You know, and, and I it, honestly, I don't want to present the Bhakti Center as some place that's totally got it all together. Um, I think it's a, a wonderful organization. I think everybody that's served there over the years, I've seen all the different incarnations. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I have respect and love for all these people and admiration for them and, and gratitude. Um, and, you know, I think the Bhakti Center has done a lot of wonderful things and, and you know, maybe... Um, broken some new ground and, and, and has had and, and does have and will have a lot to offer. Uh, and at the same time, it's, it, it has always had its challenges and always had its weaknesses and, uh, you know, will continue. And I think that's just, just life. But, I think what um, brings it, I think, yeah. sorry to cut you off. I think what brings it kind of to the forefront of a progressive and innovative Vaishnava cultural center is it's in New York. New York is like yeah. the center of the world and also the one of the hardest places to introduce Krishna consciousness. Cause I think, I mean, I, th I think people have, you know, book distributors also mentioned it's like, sometimes they skip New York. People have, <laughs> seen, people have seen everything who yeah. were there and it's like nothing, this is like nothing new to them. Like when you, a devotee with a doti and, and, or sorry, whatever, walking down the street, people don't give them a second look like they would in some other town or city or something. It's like, they've seen everything. They're kind of like, also like J very jaded, maybe jaded and proud, yeah. not in a critical way, but like yeah. that it's like, it's, it's that's just like New Yorkers. So I think that it's to the credit of the devotees 
of the Bhakti Center that able to create something nice and beautiful in this kind of very uh, not so easy environment. <laughs> I mean, it's the and, worst and the best in some ways, right? It's New York right. is a place of extremes. Yeah, it's like <laughs> India. Is. India is like the <laughs> most incredibly perfect place in the world and like the worst you know it's got like both sides to it you know yeah it's got the most incredible culture and then it's got like completely lacking culture in other ways you know it's like a, yeah it's an incredible and keep the and, electricity going for yeah yeah it's, yeah it's um, like well, you, you're looking at one person that's the most refined kind of like cultured person and they're standing next to like a puddle of s massive sewage like you know like you're in the right. street you know it's like you got in new york's kind of like that too you know? new york is like that yeah god bless new york um I guess what we want to kind of end here with is uh, what you've been up to now. I know there's wisdom oh, yeah. of this ages that everyone knows about, uh, but what else have you been up to? Well, recently? you know, um, I'm still involved at the Bucket Center, uh, mm -hmm. not as hands-on, but uh, there, there's one thing it, it, we're developing a kind of like a um, kind of like a Brahminical advisory team at the Bhakti Center. So, which I think is a, is a cool thing because it's, it's kind of like um, it's a way of not having any executive power but having a voice and then a voice that's important, you know, uh, right. in terms both on both sides, visionary as well as like kind of keeping that firmly rooted kind of standard thing. So yeah. I, I'll, I'll be, that hasn't really started yet. It's about to start. So I'll, I'll be playing a role on that, which I, I hope to be able to do something, some service for the center that way. Oh, cool. uh, but wisdom of the sages certainly takes up, you know, the majority of my time. And, um, but, you know, for us, it's like, it's a large audience. Uh, it's about, you know, we get about 6,000, uh, you know, viewers for each episode yeah. or listeners. Um, and, uh, and we are always every day receiving mail and different messages from them and uh, all kind of, just all kind of very encouraging stuff. And these are a wide range of people, but, you know, I'd say the majority of them are very new to Bhakti. You know, they came through it through, you know, seeing Raghunath and Joe Rogan and started listening and, just stayed with it, you know, and, and now, you know, they live wherever they live and they, and, and well, this is the point. So if you take 6,000 people every day, one thing is we want to get better promotion because just like I was saying before, we feel there's a lot more people that would be into it if they were exposed to it, but that's another thing. Mm -hmm. But even for the, the group that we have right now, out of those 6,000, there's going to be a large number of people that say, not only do I like enjoy listening to this or feel I'm gaining something from this, but I want to practice this. Yeah. And if I want to practice bhakti and I'm totally new to it and, and, and either I'm living somewhere where I don't know any devotees or there aren't many devotees or even if there are, I, they don't relate to me, you know, in ways that is helpful. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of, they're going to need help beyond just listening to a podcast. They're going to have questions that they need to ask. They're going to have, you know, I'm a parent and I got into this now, how does this relate to my children? How am I, do, am I supposed to make them chant? Am I supposed to, not, you know, like, what do I do? You know, that's like a real, that's like a real concern that it's you've been faced. You, it's good. Yeah. Wow. Sure. I mean, you know, we take questions and answers every day. I mean, I'm sorry, every week. Sure. You know, every Saturday we, we have questions and answers. So we get all kinds. I mean, Nam, the questions that we get. The, the the challenge that you see that people are living th there's a similarity to them and they're they're fascinating you know we the sincerity of people out there and the circumstances that they're under you know we've had questions like i don't know if i shared this with you when i was on your other show or something but like or maybe it was any case th th like for instance <laughs> like so you get people like i'm a bouncer at a strip club and my the wife the the mother of my child i live with and she's like a, a sex worker online. And I'm getting into bhakti now. Oh my gosh. And wow. you know, and, and and I'm and I'm wondering how to how how to how to raise my daughter. You know, wow. do I need to leave my job? Do I need to leave this woman? Do I need you know what what do I do? You know, it's like you know, there's just but in so many ways, again, even just something as practical as like how do I have my children? Or there could be so many other issues, Ish gender issues, right? In institutional issues. Um, uh, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. That kind of thing. Psychological challenges, you know, and, and so on. So what we want to do is we want to provide a way to reach out to that 
audience. And so yeah. we're, we're cre- what we're doing is we're creating these um, groups, discussion groups. We call them sage groups. We're just about to kick it off. Really? And yeah, so out of out of that, we we just put the word out just a little bit because we didn't. We just wanted to kind of have a beta version for a few months and yeah. experiment with it, and then try to improve it, and then open it up for more people. So we just announced it a couple of times, but we 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 meant to just kind of like limit it to a hundred people at first, but we got about one hundred and fifty right off the bat. Wow! And then and then we stopped, you know, we talking about it. And then we had to get group leaders for those groups. And we got an incredible group of group leaders, fantastic people, you know, that'll kind of guide the discussions. There'll be discussions on, um, you know, we'll provide speaking points. Um, But it's really, it's not so much like a class. It's just meant for like, I can enter a group of like about seven other people. There'll be one person in there that's more experienced than Bhakti. And we'll be able to read and discuss things together, share my doubts, share my share my victories and what I'm going through, have some friends and some people that I can talk to about what I'm going through. And, yeah. I, and I'll be able to share what my challenges are and and get some, have a little sangha there that will help me understand it. And then, but be, then beyond that, beyond that group, beyond that level. So first you have all the listeners. And then if you're going up a pyramid, then you've got these people that have joined one of these sage groups. Mm-hmm. each one with a leader but then still further up the pyramid is we put together a team of like counselors like devotee vaishnava counselors people with like professional experience in counseling but it's not just like psychological counseling we also just want to deal with all kinds of challenges that people might whatever their challenge is you know that's what happens people get into bhakti and then they hit a challenge you know and yeah. again it could be any of those things like for instance we get people that write to us saying I love your podcast and I'm totally attracted to practicing bhakti and I've been practicing now for six months and this is what I've been doing, but I struggle with depression right. and I'm wondering, am I doing it wrong? Because apparently, you know, our nature is blissful and by practicing bhakti, that nature arises, but it doesn't seem to be working for me. Am I doing something wrong? And, you know, so like, and even that can be enough for someone to just say like, this doesn't work for me and lose faith and walk away if they don't have someone that they can talk to about them and help them understand it. So that might be that group leader, or it might be the group that they're in, or the group leader may say, I've got someone here that, you know, is struggling in a particular way and you people have professional experience. Can you help them? Mm. And, and, and so what I want for, for that team to do, and that team can, right now it's got about like five people on it, excellent people but it can grow a bit too. And I, what I want to do is like draw from, draw from the groups, from the, from the sage groups, what are the most pressing challenges that people are having? You know, right. let, let's say that, you know, you, by doing surveys, let, let, let's say like, let's say like 40, let's say 35% say, yeah, parenting is a big question for me because I am a parent. I don't know how, okay, well then we need that team to begin to, to, produce resources for these people maybe zoom meetings that are recorded that people can watch in the future and ask questions and, and so on uh, you know workshops um maybe these people want to be in another group that meets once a month where they can bring out their questions you know or something maybe one person needs particular like individual attention you know okay we're gonna we're gonna help that person with whatever so i want that group to to be able to lay out on a table like here's all that we're getting back from all these people and we mm-hmm. see like, okay, a lot of people are concerned about this and and and, and another group of people are concerned about this. And, and there's a few people over here that have really important individual issues that th- they need individual. And then to begin to produce resources uh, that will address their challenges. And what I hope to, that, that that will do is really develop a dynamic kind of way that people can stick with it and feel right. like I'm not out here all alone and someone's willing to hear me and, and, and um, understand me. And that resources can be developed in this that that can be shared with other people too, you know. I guess the the what I would see off um, from hearing what you were saying is that what if someone is like the reason I got into this was because of Kastuba Prabhu and Raghunath Prabhu. Now I'm going further into this and I want to stick. Like the attraction is with you guys, but then now you're like kind of scaling this this thing. But then they still want to be connected with you. 
maybe even further than just the hearing the podcast? How would you deal with a challenge like that? Well, what we also want to do with that is that's we we try to deal with that through different trainings and retreats and pilgrimages. Right. So right, that's right. another way. And, and you know, Raghunath, uh, he's really looking into developing his super soul farm into more like an academy. And we're thinking that you know. Um, for most of the year, winters, we'd probably travel a lot, but for most of the year, and especially like maybe the summers could be like, you can come there and spend a week, a month, two months, three months, whatever fits into your schedule and really live in an ashram mm. uh, and and get trained, you know, like have wow. have courses that, you know, kind of systemized courses that people can go through. So we want to develop all that too. Um, yes. So that's, that. so I think on both ends, these are important, but I really feel like to have a group of good devotees that have different uh, types of professionals. Some of these people have li are like um, hospital chaplains. Some of these people, you know, are, are you know professional uh, psychiatrists. You know, but, but also bringing in different kind of you know people that know about like a relationship counseling, people that know about um, conflict resolution, people that you know. But but at the same time, good devotees, you know, and caring yeah. devotees. I really, I'm really hopeful we can address all kind of issues that are happening outside of the wisdom and sages community, but they're just happening in every bhakti community out there. You know, yeah. for instance, let's say, let's say that this grows and there's many hundreds of people in it. Um, imagine if, like, they saw that, like, say, within 500 people, that you had like 15 women that came forward and saying, you know, like, I, I was a victim of rape, and I struggle with this. I, you know, mentally, I struggle with it. I don't know if I deserved it. Is that what this philosophy is telling me? Or maybe I, that's not the issue, but it, it's it's created um, a, a sense of anxiety in me or a sense of depression or whatever, and, and I struggle with this. Yeah. And then what if that if that team said, okay, let's create a whole another group just for these people, just for these women, where they can really open up in a way that they would never be able to do in an ISKCON temple or, you know, like, you know, you know, we already are, already are our bhakti recovery you know we have a bhakti recovery group which is like yes you know for people that through our podcast are practicing bhakti but have struggled with whatever kind of addiction they may have and that and that group is just it's a place where they can open up and share what they're going through and it makes the a world of difference for these people so mm. i think this is just a way of expanding that and, and recognizing that there's so many people out there that have come to bhakti and been touched by the devotees and touched by Srila Prabhupada's books and aren't practicing just because we're not reaching out far enough or we're, we're, we're not um, understanding what their issues are. Let them explain to us what the issues are, what their obstacles are, and let's get together and see what we can do to, to help them uh, through it. So I'm wow. excited about these SAGE groups and uh, I'm, I'm really grateful to everyone that's taken part in them. And Great, you're making it into a you're making it into like an empire now. <laughs> I don't see it exactly as an empire, <laughs> but, uh, it's great. but it is. It's it, it is. Yeah, it has different aspects and it's growing. So we're Comp excited. I think that's see this like whole jogging your mind on how to make it comprehensive, make it relatable, make it important, to make it you know grow it. It's just like that's exactly what I think. Like thinking big in that way is something that's so important. Uh, how to how to reach a, a really wide audience, and I and I really appreciate that. Well, we're we're out of time, Prabhu. That's that's. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate our conversation. I feel like we could go on another two hours. <laughs> we I could. Really, I love to talk yeah. maybe in the future about some other topics with you. You always have a great. I'd be happy to. I appreciate. One it. thing that I really in am interested about is um, probably you hear this from just like dealing with kind of touchy issues when it comes to introducing people to Christian consciousness, whether it be gender issues, whether it's, uh, you know, um, any, any kind of thing like Guru issues, might... institutional issues. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So how to explain that in a way that's, you know, it, you come across it all the time, I'm sure. So just to hear yeah. your, your part of that would be really interesting. If you want to get in yeah. touch with Kastuba Brabu, he's on Instagram. Uh, that's his handle there at Kastuba. K A U S T U B H A for the all the audio listeners here, and then um, I had the wisdom of the sages stickering there at the bottom, and also wisdom of the sages. Fo uh, follow them on um, on Instagram, on Facebook. They have a podcast every single day and much, uh, yeah. every every morning, and they talk about the Bhagavatam. Please join them. It's wonderful, beautiful conversations that they have. Um, so 
Prabhu, Prabhu, please stay on. Thank you again for joining. Thanks. And uh, I'm just going to turn off the recording. And thank you. I just thank all the listeners. I thank you, Nam, yes. and I pray for for all of your blessings. Thank you so much. You. Really appreciate it. Hare Krishna. Have a great rest of your evening. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna.